This is a Digital Music Trends 151 recorded on the 25th of September 2013. On the show, YouTube's offline mode, disconnecting music services from Facebook, Microsoft's Surface DJ experiment, iTunes radio numbers, Discover, BitTorrent and much more. This week's show is sponsored by media law firm Sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, uh, Spreaker, Stitcher and the TuneIn Radio. To get in touch with the show, you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week, I'm super happy to introduce two new faces to the show. And first up is Emily White from White Smith Entertainment. Oh. And actually, uh, Emily is not 100% new to the show because uh, uh, she joined us back in uh, uh, January at Medium for a special for a special recording on the event. Uh, so hi, Emily. How's it going? Uh, everything right your own? Going great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And uh, my second guest this week is uh, Seth Jackson, MD and founder at Strange Thoughts. So uh, great to have you on, Seth. And uh, uh, what is Strange, uh, Strange Thoughts all about? Yeah, good to be here. Good, good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Pub. That's yes. the only place I normally see you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, so Strange Thoughts is an agency working with brands and technology. Uh, so essentially, we work using interesting cutting edge technology paid for by brands, seeing how we can implement that into campaigns and quite often into an artist live show or an artist campaign. Oh, great. And uh, Emily, uh, at Whitesmith, uh, uh, what you guys are up to? Uh, is there anything, uh, any new artists that you're excited about or any new release that you want to plug? Uh, yeah, we just had Future Monarchs to do their first ever tour. They're from Chicago and it was in the UK supporting Brandon Benson. So that was great, and we're very busy setting up the Autumn Defenses record for January, which is Pat and John from Wilco, and it's a beautiful record. So uh, that's the tip of the iceberg, so lots going on over here. <laughs> Absolutely, that's great. And, uh, and so uh, this week, I'm going to open with uh, YouTube, and uh, uh, the news uh, this week was that YouTube is on the verge of making uh, the majority of its videos available in, in a special offline mode by its mm -hmm. mobile application. So this is according to a memo that was surfaced by All Things D uh, earlier this week. Uh, and the video giant is sending apparently memos to uh, the major uh, uh, content providers uh, to, to the site to let them know that this is going to happen and that they can opt out if they want to. So uh, this should all go live in November, uh, although uh, uh, you know we don't really know what the reaction of uh, the creators is going to be like uh, on that front. Uh, if the feature will only allow users to cache uh, the video for 48 hours, uh, letting them catch up with their favorite YouTube videos offline. And I mean, for me, it's great. I, I love the, that idea because uh, I love the fact that people could actually you know, cash uh, digital music trends as a podcast essentially on YouTube and then watch it wherever they are because it's quite a long show really. And so uh, so for me, that's great. But uh, um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the reaction of the music industry is going to be. We've already heard from an executive of, at Vivo that um, uh, was reported by Variety that uh, they're not going to allow this feature to be implemented, of course, across the Vivo videos. So, uh, Emily, do you want to uh, start off by telling us what your, th your thoughts about this offline caching feature? And do you think oh. the music industry should be scared about it? Uh, they should definitely not be scared. I think it's a shame that Vivo is not supporting it because we need to think about it from the user's perspective and really do things that make sense. So your average user doesn't really understand the difference between downloading a song from iTunes and having it on their iPod and being able to stream Spotify or RDO anywhere in the world. Um, we're thinking about those things and thinking about the connect behind the scenes. Um, so when I explain that to kind of regular music fans and, and non-tech people, I say, you know, with streaming, um, you don't have to download things. You could be on a mountain, you could be at anywhere that you have a phone service, you know, you can access this content. And yeah. Yeah, I see a light bulb go off. And then also I explain, you know, on RDO and things like that, you can sync certain songs and albums. So it works. Uh, I mean, we're starting to get uh, phone service on the subway here in New York, but um, you know, it works if you're on the subway or you're on an airplane without Wi-Fi or whatever. So that, all that is doing is applying this to video, which is great because that's a more robust form of content than individual music files. So it's very exciting for the users. And, you know, that's it's really a shame to hear about Vivo because I always want my artists to be as exposed as possible. And yeah. in this ADD society, you know, if somebody can't get Brennan Benson's video right away, they're going to move on to the next thing. So that's really a shame and, and we shouldn't be blocking content. Yeah, and Seth Emily's position is really interesting. And of course, Vivo is owned for the majority of by Sony and Universal. And so their perspective, I guess, is that they are, they're probably worried about 
uh, the fact that the, the main reason why uh, users subscribe to uh, services like Spotify, Audio, or Deezer uh, as a premium user is because they can have that caching functionality on their phone. So if that moves into YouTube, what does that mean for those services? Do you think that's that, that's a concern that people might have, for, exa for example? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's, there is a, a, a temporary truth to this that what they're offering is a premium kind of service, such as you would expect with a paid-for yeah. premium service. Um, and there is a challenge there that there may be cannibalization, but really we're talking about a micro second in time where that's important. For a start, the key thing is that people are being paid for this content. Yeah. So, you know, there is advertising there, there is a revenue stream that is monetized. Secondly, they can opt out, of course, as Viva are saying they will do. Um, so it's up to the content creator. But third, none of this matters. All of this is just wasting time and having small little bun fights, which you know are relevant for short-term revenue, until we have full connectivity everywhere, and then which is all we're reaching for. And then exactly as Emily says, this is about the consumer. They don't care. They don't know. They don't want to know. They just want it to work wherever they are. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's, that's an interesting one. I mean, uh, it's also going to be f fun to see how they implement the advertising side of things and how they manage to do that side of the caching. Uh, aspects, uh, um, especially if they, they should just find. include the ad. I don't really see why it's a problem. You know, I mean, I think the ads are really annoying anyway. But it, I mean, if that's where they make their revenue, just include the ad with the offline video. I, I would imagine that's what they're going to do. Um, uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how they how they do that and 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 how much space that takes and how much that annoys the user as well. Because of course, caching yeah. takes a certain amount of time. Uh, anyway, and so uh, it's going to be quite fun to see how they implement that. But as I said, like for long-term, con long, long, con long-form content, that's that's a, a really important move, I think, just because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have time to just sit by a browser or work and watch like an hour-long show or a half an hour-long show. And if they can take it with them and watch it in chunks uh, over a couple of days, then it makes it makes a whole difference, I think. Uh, Absolutely. Very interesting. And uh, I wanted to sort of move on to. Uh, a sort of controversial subject that uh, uh, Ian Rogers, CEO of Daisy, brought up this week, uh, which is his extreme dislike for streaming services that connect uh, uh, your uh, streaming history to all uh, to, to to Facebook, and so like everybody can know what you're listening to uh, in a sort of spammy way, and nobody really seems to be that excited uh, excited about the feature. Uh, right. Facebook ends up with all the data about about your music listening habits, which were they were very vocal about uh, when they illustrated the latest results of of the of their their graph uh, on the music front uh, I, I think only a few weeks ago uh, and so Ian Rogers actually uh, wrote uh, uh, something along the lines is uh, this is not a music discovery feature it's a music service discovery feature uh, uh, you know I promise you Beats Music uh, will not do the barf everything you play on Facebook bullshit so pretty strong words and if your music service has currently been uh, barfing every track you play to Facebook turn that shit off and so he uh, goes on to give people actually uh, uh, some clues as to how to do that and, and some instructions because it's not uh, particularly straightforward really for and it's different for every single service so uh, uh, Seth uh, do, do, do you feel the same way that uh, there's there's no point in having that link between uh, the, the social music service and, and uh, Facebook between the streaming music service and Facebook, uh, or do you feel that, that that could work for for some people? Well, I mean, Ian's not exactly being <laughs> independent in this, but of course yeah. he's right. <laughs> it's incredibly, incredibly annoying. Yeah. Um, it relies on you being a single user that uses only you use your music and only you use your music for a specific purpose of defining yourself. If, on the other hand, you use music for work, you use music for your kids' parties, your 11-year-old starts playing on your music services, then it's obviously not a feature for you. But yeah. as long as you can turn it off and turn it on, I don't see it's a massive challenge. And you know, I love the fact that Ian's put in detailed, detailed instructions on how to separate out your accounts. <laughs> I don't think this is some big stalking evil. I think it's a slightly annoying feature that people will be able to turn off. But it's part symptomatic of a bigger problem, which is not understanding that not everyone uses music like a teenager does to define themselves. Yeah, and it's also a symptomatic of the fact that people might agree to do that when they turn on the streaming service and then may never realize that that's happening again. Yeah. And so maybe that's just a way of making them think about what they allowed Facebook to do when they first signed up to uh, RDO or Deezer or Spotify via that social platform. Uh, Emily, do, 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 you, do you love it or hate it? 
Um, I think it needs to be about user choice. So it's yeah. not necessarily a black or white issue. I think when Spotify initially did that, they have really good intentions. You know, like I got my dad in a Spotify who isn't really tech savvy, and it's probably easier for him to just to click on log in with my Facebook. Yeah. And then, you know, the other intention was spreading the word on music. So I think that was good. It just can't be the only way because there's a lot of people who are going to want to share what they're doing. And that's great for me as an artist manager, like absolutely spread the word. But there's there's others that don't like you, you know, referenced um, when there's multiple users on the account and, and things like that. But it was it's pretty hilarious to me when that got going. For example, I mean, this is just like a really specific example, but I was tipped off about uh, a potentially another manager who was trying to poach one of my bands and I happened to go look on his Facebook page and I could see that he had been listening to the <laughs> band so I just liked it <laughs> um, so it's amazing I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that really don't want people to see what they're listening to yeah. but yeah ultimately it's going to come down to twice I think it's really cool that your social media can be connected to your streaming account I mean I tweet out songs all the time that I'm listening to but it shouldn't be the only way yeah Show me a default, and uh, and we're gonna see how how Daisy deals with that uh, when it comes out. We're, you know, we're all waiting with open arms uh, to see what they what they're gonna finally reveal yeah. in the next few weeks. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, and Microsoft this week unveiled the Surface 2 tablet, which is definitely not something I would cover on the show usually, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's not particularly exciting. I, I don't see you guys running out of the door and, and to buy go and buy a new Surface 2. Uh, mm-hmm. or <laughs> but they made it interesting from a, from a music perspective uh, when they announced a new DJ tool, which essentially transforms that uh, uh, keyboard case, which was quite cool when they announced the Surface last year. Uh, it's like a flat keyboard essentially that you attach it's a bit like the case the ipad has but it has a keyboard built into it and they substituted the, the keyboard with a, a dj control uh, surface which is uh, pretty cool uh, so you you can actually uh, use that with a, a dj application uh, i think it may have some actual music uses as well because uh, it's got a bunch of controllers on it that can probably be assigned to different functions and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, is actually available on uh, 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 marked up the website, but I totally forgot what it was. Uh, but yeah, essentially, uh, oh yeah, it's Surface uh, Remix Remix Project dot com, uh, where you can find more information on this. And uh, so it's it's pretty interesting. It's very gimmicky as well, but it's generated quite a bit of interest in the in the community of music creators and DJs. So uh, you know, of course, the problem of Microsoft is that they haven't got many apps that uh, go alongside that, uh, and so maybe that's a way for them to try and drag more developers to create music. Uh, making applications for the surface uh, but but why do you think Microsoft brought brought this out do you think it's just uh, showing off this cool idea to try and get some buzz or is it actually after a slice of the market that otherwise wouldn't even remotely think about getting a surface which which are DJs uh, Emily right I'm gonna guess that you know from a business perspective they realize they I mean not completely generalized but they don't really appeal to creative users so I think that's a smart attempt, and ultimately it's going to fail or succeed if that platform is relevant to that community. Yeah. So if it's if it's just a gimmick, it's not going to last. But if it's truly cool, yeah, there's a certain you know section of people that that are going to want that. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, Seth, uh, well, how yeah. do you feel Microsoft is placing itself here? I mean, I I agree with Emily, but the idea that you have an accessory to go with an app. That's going to get awfully <laughs> heavy to walk around yeah. with your 27 accessories to match your 30 apps. I mean, it's nice. It's obviously a beautiful piece of kit. And as Emily says, I'm sure it will break into some market that they don't normally, they're not normally in. It doesn't feel like a significant move to me. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is actually you, at the moment it's not for sale. Uh, if you are interested in the idea, you can go and create a, uh, I think it's a, a uh, Vine video of, uh, to post uh, to Microsoft uh, with your proposed use or, or how you'd like to use uh, this, this accessory and they actually are going to give a bunch of Surface 2s plus the accessory away to creators to, to let them play around with this so I so guess it's done. <laughs> yeah it's yeah. essentially and I guess they're going to see by the response whether it's worth for them to actually spend money on, on making this available on a larger scale or not uh, it's, uh, it's not a bad it's not a bad idea. It's a bit like Google Glass, you know. Just uh, get a few, few hundred out there and see see how people use it. But yeah, yeah at least they're trying, you know. And yeah. if it's reasonably priced and the application is amazing, people are going to use it. But that's really the only way. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I can just imagine somebody's already working on, 
exactly the same thing for the iPad. They would probably sell about a mm. hundred times more, but you know, that's just yeah, uh, <laughs> totally. <laughs> that's just me. And uh, <laughs> there's a couple of DJ stories actually this week, which uh, which uh, we don't normally talk m- much about on the show. And and the other one is that we had a report uh, that the application e- EDJing uh, raised the 2.5 million dollars in funding to expand its operations, and that was led by entrepreneur uh, um, entrepreneur venture, uh, but also uh, Deezer founder Daniel uh, Mar- Marley. Oh, I can't pronounce this. Uh, Daniel <laughs> Marley. <laughs> Uh, was involved uh, so the, the app is free uh, to download and it's already da- been downloaded over 10 million times so it's been pretty successful so far and it started monetizing by uh, doing the, the freemium thing so it's, it's uh, selling add-ons to, to what the, the prospective DJs can do uh, so that's an interesting uh, fundraise for them and also the, the interesting thing is the fact that they partner with Deezer so that Deezer plus subscribers can actually use uh, the tracks uh, on Deezer to, to remix uh, within the application so th- that, that I think raises an interesting question uh, from my end which is uh, uh, how much uh, will third-party apps w- w- will be able to do with the music that is has been licensed to a streaming service if the streaming yeah. service uh, makes that music available to third-party apps that uh, may uh, include some level of creativity like uh, EDJ does with the possibility of remixing the track. Uh, so, uh, Seth, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do you think that there's going to start to be some pushback from the label front on the fact that some of the services are licensing their APIs to technologies that are, are more than just uh, uh, streaming? It's a very grey area, isn't yeah. it, suddenly? I mean, suddenly when you're creating new works from something that's been put under a streaming licence, I mean, from a consumer point of view, it's brilliant. Of course it is. There's going to be lots more apps. Um, I mean, Discover, that we're probably going to talk about later, is obviously doing much the same thing. The more you are service independent and you can pull in music from lots of different services and allow creativity around it amazing from a licensing perspective though i think there is going to be some battles to come who's going to pick that up and really fight with it i'm not sure yeah emily do you feel like uh, there's an opportunity here for uh, for example in the gaming industry or anything like that to leverage some of these uh, uh, big catalogs to create more engaging experience for, for consumers yeah, these things are always tough. In theory, I'm so all for it because I just think it's really cool and creative and, you know, our artists can get content they may never have thought of and it's really fun for the users. But there's obviously two sides here. People are going to be really protective about their content. And also, and I, I've dealt with this even with like, you know, fan artwork contests or whatever, the, the public is going to be very protective of their work too. But I think we should try it on select artists because that's really, really exciting. And hopefully the attorneys can be creative enough where these things are thought about, you know, like what are the next steps like for licensing and and things like that. And that way, these cool, fun, creative things aren't held up in, you know, rights holders uh, protecting their art and the public being too greedy. I I do think you can find a happy medium with those things. And the point of this is is to try new things and and be fun and, and be innovative. So I think it's really cool. Everybody just, I mean, it's, it's very idealistic. Everybody just has to kind of get along. Get along, yeah, exactly. And there is an application actually that is uh, focusing on the DJ market uh, on streaming, which is Pulse Locker, which I've had mm-hmm. on the show a couple mm-hmm. of times in the last year or so, uh, where th- whereby they are actually creating uh, a licensing environment. They're actually doing the licenses in order mm-hmm. to be able to offer uh, uh, caching uh, offline uh, and uh, uh, compatibility with applications like Tractor, for example, for DJs to use. But they also pay higher streaming rates for users that are doing that to a particular tracks. And so that makes the model more, uh, I guess, uh, digestible to, to labels right. at the moment. So uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that, how that shapes up um, in the future. And in the second half of the show, we're going to talk about iTunes Radio's first numbers, Twitter's new head of music, Discover, BitTorrent, and a new study on internet radio. But first, a brief information piece with our sponsors for this week, media law firm Sheridan's. I'm here with Tahir Bashir from Sheridan's and uh, uh, we're going to continue our series of segments by talking about digital service providers or DSPs. And on the show, of course, you know, we we talk about DSPs a lot uh, and uh, namely they, we call them startups most of the time. So, <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, let's go back, uh, let's backtrack to the history of, uh, you know, the, the music industry or, and startups and technology. There's always been a bit of suspicion there. Uh, and, uh, you know, why do you think that is? Well, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I think, you know, historically there's always been this 
concept that uh, with any kind of DSP, it, you know, the seen as disruptive technologies, uh, which effectively is seen as a threat because ultimately, if the technology changes the way that everybody's been doing, uh, carrying out their activities in the music industry, then that means that certain people won't have jobs and uh, there's certain income streams which change. So, you know, from my perspective, right from the start when when I got involved with a whole load of DSPs, you know, many many years back, it's always a co concept of trying to change that. Uh, issue of it being a threat and trying to turn that into it being an opportunity. Yeah, and so that's essentially you know the, the best strategy for any startup that's looking at uh, dealing with uh, uh, rights, hold, uh, rights holders to really show what they can do and show that even if they are disruptive that that is not a, th a complete threat that actually that's an opportunity for them. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the record company or the label or the rights holders, um, you know, you're talking to a number of those guys who are business development people, yeah. they're looking for income, they're looking for w different ways of using their rights. So you, you as the DSP have to show the value of your product to them, even if it means diminishing value in other areas. Good example being, you know, digital music distribution might result in uh, diminishing values in physical music distribution. Uh, but ultimately, if that's the way things are going, there's no choice. But also, you know, you need to get on there to monetize that, uh, the digital distribution uh, aspects of it. Yeah, sure. And how important is it to demonstrate your product as well to your prospective, uh, uh, you know, uh, rights holders that, that you want to make a deal with as a startup? Is that really a big factor in, in, in their decision as well? Uh, very much so. Uh, ultimately, uh, you think of uh, labels and content owners as the equivalent of investors. An investor doesn't invest in something that they don't, they can't see, um, unless unless the people behind that investment, uh, so in that product, has a track record. So ultimately, you're in much better position if you can show your product, even if it's a prototype, even if it's you know in beta, um, so that there is a feel for the you know the design, the user interface, and what you're trying to achieve. That's great. Well, thank you so much, and until the next segment. Thank you very much. And we talked about uh, briefly about uh, iTunes Radio last week as part of the iOS, iOS 7 launch. And Apple has already st stated in a press release that the radio has been used by 11 million users in the United States alone in the past in, in, the, in the first week of uh, since release. Uh, so uh, you know, of course, there's no in, there's no indication at all whether these users will stick around. And I would imagine a lot of people that install the operating system will actually fire up. Uh, iTunes Radio because it's free. You're already logged into your Apple ID when you have the device, so why not? Uh, so they're going to give it a go. But it's it's interesting because it is uh, you know already a seventh of uh, uh, Pandora's uh, um, monthly active users, which is, which is just over 70 million, and it's double uh, a songs that monthly user base uh, according to the latest numbers, which was just under five million. So uh, you know this is a very interesting uh, new development for for iTunes Radio, and and the numbers were predictable, but it's always interesting to hear them in you know. Or to see them written down because they are they are staggering. Uh, so uh, Stephen Opper actually from Rolling Stone posted a good piece summing up some of the potential potential strength uh, of uh, iTunes Radio. And one of his excellent points was the fact that Pandora is great, and uh, Apple might have a hard time in the states actually breaking that stronghold that Pandora has. But internationally, Pandora has no foothold whatsoever, and right. Apple has built a very powerful ecosystem in uh, uh, n many many countries with a very specialized specialized catalog and, and most labels I, I would imagine of those territories actually have their uh, material on iTunes if the service is available in that country and so that makes it for an incredibly powerful uh, international tool if uh, uh, they manage to get the licenses to expand internationally so uh, Seth how do you feel about uh, iTunes radio from a UK perspective if they were to launch in the UK that would be a pretty huge thing because we don't have any competitors at the moment uh, uh, over here no from a UK and European perspective I think it's massive um, I think, what have they got, 119 countries or something? I Apple think so, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I mean, once you put that scale in, Pandora does not really seem that threatening to them. Yeah. I personally think they're going to own this market in a pretty short space of time. And, you know, whilst I'd rather there were competitors around, I think something that works across that kind of global scale, you know, it's going to be great. Yeah. Emily, have you tried it out? I haven't had anybody on the show yet who has tried it out or has uh, no, heard no, no. direct opinions on, on how it works. Uh, any thoughts on that? I haven't tried it out, but again, here's going to be the main difference from the user's perspective. Pandora's 
you know, music genome project is phenomenal. And that's why, you know, the user experience is so great. And years and years of work went into that. So yeah. Apple's really going to match that. When I try kind of other, you know, artist-driven online radio platforms, they're, they're just not as good as Pandora. Like Pandora, it's just, it feels like magic. Um, so that's, that's on the public end. Now on the back end, an area that Apple could really win on, and, and they have, you know, so much money to pull from is paying by royalty rates. You know, something yeah. I've never understood about Pandora is why they can't pay the you know publishing side and the master side equally, just like we do in Sync World and, and things like that. And then you're not going to have these fights and battles when people could be really working together. So Apple, you know, could come out as as kind of the good guy or girl and be like, you know, we're going to pay royalty rates that make sense and, and that's that's gonna get a big buzz in, in B2B. And of course, internationally, Apple just being such a strong brand um, is, is gonna be huge. But again, the, the product has to be great. So as Pandora develops in other countries, if, if people do have a choice and they realize that the Led Zeppelin channel on Pandora is way more interesting to them than something that's just kind of thrown together. Oh. Um, you know, I mean, for me, all I use, I, I, have, I basically use two music apps on my phone, Pandora and a streaming platform. I, I, I use RDO, you know? Yeah. Sorry, I'm to my friends Spotify. Um, so it, maybe people will make that choice. Maybe they want it all in one. Um, but Pandora just delivers such a high level of service. It's, it's such a unique product. That's why I use it. Have you, have you ever felt like Pandora, because I haven't used it much myself. I mean, I have a VPN and I use some of the services at times just to check them out. But I haven't really uh, used it that much. But I've heard that there are some restrictions in terms of catalog. Uh, uh, on the Pandora front, which is uh, apparently much more limited than what iTunes radios will, will be mm -hmm. eventually. Yeah, that's exciting, and that's going to play into it as well. I mean, if there's more songs on iTunes radio, that's great. Um, they're going to have to put a lot of work into getting that algorithm correct, but they're Apple, yeah. so they have plenty of people that can figure that out. <laughs> and Seth, Seth, do you think Apple is kind of uh, shooting itself in the foot uh, by not making this available outside its own ecosystem, or is it just the way it has to be for them to be able to leverage the service towards selling hardware? That's just how they do it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's how they always do it. Uh, would you expect them to do it any other way? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, iTunes is available on, on, on Windows, for example, but they might... Uh, actually, uh, it's a good question, actually. I don't know. I know they've rolled out iTunes with iTunes Radio, but I don't know whether that's been rolled out to Windows machines, machines as well. That'd be... I, I'd have to assume so. I yeah, think that's pretty be. standard at this point. And, yeah. and to get those kind of numbers. Exactly. And so maybe that's, that's another draw to get people excited and say, oh, look, we have this exciting new radio service. Uh, we're going to buy uh, an iPhone... 5C now and, uh, and save a whole uh, $100 over a whatever, how, however many thousands of dollar contract, which is, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which is absolutely ridiculous. But, you know. mm. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a fun, interesting thing. And another uh, uh, news is that uh, the radio has been rolled out to the Apple TV as well. So they updated mm. the software on that front. Uh, and of course, you know, that was going to happen anyway. The, the other cool thing of the Apple TV update is that they added podcasting support. Uh, uh, as a dedicated app, as far as uh, I've been told, I haven't updated my Apple TV yet, so I don't know. Uh, but that's really cool because uh, I, I always like when there's easier ways for people to access the show. So, from a very selfish perspective, that's uh, <laughs> that's all good. <laughs> and actually, yeah, the video show actually does really good numbers on the Apple TV, especially, uh, which is uh, remarkable because uh, of all the downloads from the video, the video show I would say that forty percent are uh, views from the Apple TV at the moment. So that's. Uh, mm -hmm. That's quite an interesting uh, number to, to throw around. And uh, uh, so moving on from uh, Apple to Twitter, uh, Twitter is uh, shaping up a very interesting music strategy at the moment. So um, uh, let's uh, talk about what happened this week, but we can tie that into what's been happening in the last few weeks. So their active, platform, uh, their active fan platform Top Spin Media lost another top executive this week uh, since uh, Bob uh, uh, Moksidowski uh, is, according to All Things D, moving to Twitter to become the new head of music. So uh, he was uh, Top Spin's SVP of product and marketing. And, uh, uh, you know, Top Spin uh, and Twitter is, m is making headways into the music space. Uh, for example, they hired uh, Ticketmaster's ex-CEO Nathan Hubbard, uh, Hubbard a few weeks ago uh, as a head of commerce. And uh, Hubbard made some very interesting remarks as to the positioning of music within that co uh, commerce platform and how 
uh, important Twitter could be in uh, helping artists sell uh, all sorts of things from music to merchandise to tickets. Uh, and so uh, bringing in somebody from Top Spin into the music department as well, uh, who has clearly got uh, a lot of experience in product because Top Spin also deal with a lot of uh, uh, physical deliverables as well. Uh, so th it makes for an interesting vertical at Twitter and how they're placing the music strategy. Uh, where do you think Twitter is going with all this? I think it's really great that they're involving people like Bob and Nathan because I, I love Twitter and I, you know, I've had a fear kind of the last couple of weeks that, um, you know, with, with Twitter going public and, and things like that, it, it's, I don't want to say losing its edge, but some of my most tastemaker friends are actually off Twitter at this point. And I, I do see it, it you know, I, a lot, a lot of people feel like they're just being marketed to. So we really need to be mindful and aware of that. It's not going to go away. It's going to be like Facebook where people start to get irritated with certain things, but you still have a Facebook page. So I think what's cool about bringing in people, um, you know, that have been at Ticketmaster and, and Topspin and know how to deal with consumers is ultimately to succeed. They're going to have to be able to deliver music and ticket and content in a way that is fun and makes sense because otherwise people are just going to turn it off. Yeah. Seth, well, what, well, how do you feel about this uh, new positioning of Twitter in, in respect to music? So, uh, I was, so I think Bob's a legend. I think he's a great hire. Um, but I do think it's a surprising hire, only in as much as I would almost have bet that they were going to take a traditional music industry person from a label or just, even from a distributor, but from a more traditional music background. Yeah. Um, I think it's a smart move. I think Bob's going to be great at that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. And, uh, uh, and mo turning the table around, what are your thoughts on Topspin of late? So this, uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, news on the product front coming out of Topspin uh, in the last few months. Uh, and perhaps we'll have to wait for Daisy to come out uh, to see the real synergy that's going to happen between the two services. Uh, but, uh, you, know, you know, do you think that that sort of lack of uh, exciting new products may have been also a factor in, 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 in seeing uh, him go, for example? Well, I've, I've seen lots of my drinking buddies stop, <laughs> leave Top Spin recently. So uh, yeah. I haven't used their services in a while, so I can't really comment. Yeah, exactly. From my perspective, you know, Top Spin was, uh, it, it's kind of like, you know how people call streaming services Spotify? They just say Spotify. Yeah. That's what people were doing with Top Spin and direct to fan right. So to me, Top Spin was never necessarily a tool more than kind of teaching people direct to fan and you know if, if they're moving on from that cool but for me I you know I'm on the board of cash music so I've always used their tools and it's the same concept exactly and and, and uh, I guess like pledge for example it might, might, might be starting to take a little bit of the uh, a bite out of uh, a top spin market as well in, in the way that they are placing themselves as, as yeah. a, a, a service in the direct to fan uh, you know, from artists to consumers, so that's it's going to be interesting. Uh, and uh, okay, so uh, I wanted to chat a little bit about uh, Discover. So Discover is an is a uh, an application that's been around for three years. So a lot of people have used it or played with it. That listen to the show. Uh, it was doing some really great graphical representations of uh, uh, sort of if you liked an artist, they would suggest like four or five artists that were stemming from that one, and then you could keep building this uh, crazy uh, spider web graph uh, uh, to infinity essentially and make this really cool uh, representations. Find out more about the artist, find bi biographies, videos, and everything else. And uh, yesterday they launched a complete overhaul of the platform for uh, of the app for iOS seven. Uh, and, and that brings in a whole, uh, it's essentially a new app. Uh, so, you know, now they bring in uh, uh, the experience, uh, you know, they bring in each user's preferred music uh, from uh, both social networks and streaming services. Uh, you know, they surface the latest videos, articles and photos from artists. Uh, so they follow the artist's accounts and, and it, when they post new photos or uh, something appears or like a review or something like that, that comes into your feed. Uh, they also uh, added uh, 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 um, a social layer so you can post things on this feed and it will appear on the feed of people that are following you a little bit like Twitter uh, you know they have notifications as well push notifications on that front uh, and the other really cool thing is that they added integration with audio uh, Deezer and uh, Spotify and SoundCloud so that you can log into those platforms and if you're a premium subscriber to one of the first three services that I mentioned then you can get access to all of those tracks uh, and listen to them in their entirety and also operate cross-platform so if you suggest a track to a friend 
and you're an audio user and your, uh, your other friend is on Spotify, he can pick up the track and play it through Discover without having to think about it. It's just like a seamless experience on that front. So uh, I'm really interested in this concept of aggregation uh, because uh, there's a lot of fragmentation in the, in the marketplace. And uh, I feel like services like, like this one, like Tomahawk, for example, based in, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, there's a, a J in New York and also a, a bunch of other developers uh, around uh, the rest of the world. Uh, they are trying to solve this puzzle of a fragmentation. Uh, Seth, how do you how do you feel uh, Discover is placing itself, and can it can it finally succeed where other apps have failed in trying to aggregate different feeds uh, and presenting an interesting and engaging experience that people actually want to go back to instead of just using once and, and not going back to it ever again? I'm pretty sure they can. I mean, they they may. Their design is so beautiful yeah. and has always been every time they've used it. The interface is great. Um, you know, you mentioned Tomahawk. That's obviously the way to do these things, if you possibly can. But it is all, again, for a very, very specific market. Yeah. So if you're the kind of person that is a premium subscriber to multiple services, if, you, if all of your music taste is linear and about you and defining yourself, then brilliant. If you're not one of those people, again, the service doesn't make much sense. Um, I downloaded it earlier today. I'm looking at it. The picture it's drawing, and that's what it's doing, it's drawing a picture of you across your music services and then aggregating that content. I don't recognize that picture because okay. it's, it's based on faulty data, essentially, because of the using habits. But for the right market, I think the idea of what they're doing, they're doing right, they're doing it beautifully. Yeah. It's just for a very specific market. It is, and, and uh, the interesting move that they did as well is they made the app free, so you can download it for free now, whilst before it was always, I think, $4.99 or somewhere along those lines. So they, they made quite a bit of money uh, out of selling the app uh, outright, and uh, now the move to free implies that they want to move this into a mass play uh, and make money uh, elsewhere, which, uh, uh, as you're saying, Seth, uh, might be a little bit uh, more difficult. So, um, Emily, what, what are your thoughts on aggregation services that, that allow people to communicate through, through different services? I love the concept and people are going to use it if they make sense, if, if it makes sense. You know, it's really great that it, uh, you know, you can go across different platforms in the same category. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually always looking at aggregate services, even if it's, you know, that company roll up that rolls up all your email subscriptions and things like that. I'm always looking at ways to make things more efficient and yeah. easier. And I think the public is too, because we've just been inundated with all these amazing tools and exciting things over the past decade. But now we're kind of making sense of it and picking and choosing what we want, you know, so there's a lot of noise. And if we can organize things in a way that makes sense for people, they're going to use it. But if, it, if it's just like the concept, oh, you can you can tweet, you can do this, you can do that. It, you know, nobody's gonna care. So there needs to be thought behind it. And if it makes people's lives easier and it's fun, they're gonna use it. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, uh, one of the big news that came out uh, today, actually, so it's a very uh, uh, fresh uh, news. Uh, I don't even know if you guys managed to have a look at it, but uh, I, I'm gonna illustrate it uh, quite briefly. Is that BitTorrent uh, finally uh, launched uh, a, a broader uh, version of its uh, bundles, BitTorrent bundles that we covered on the show quite a bit uh, over the last few months uh, with eight. Uh, uh, initial media partners, uh, so it's still a closed uh, alpha essentially, but uh, it's uh, broadening to uh, a number of partners that are going to integrate that service uh, uh, within uh, more and more of their artist campaigns. So the partners are Fader, uh, Cinedigma, The Collective, uh, of course, uh, Topspin, uh, Interloper Films, Gravitas Ventures, Converge Studios, and uh, Tim uh, Ferris. Uh, so uh, some pretty high profile partners here to launch with, uh, so it really strengthens uh, uh, BitTorrent's goal to simplify the direct to fan practice and create uh, uh, something very meaningful out of that community of uh, tens or hundreds of millions of users that are still using BitTorrent. Uh, so uh, how do you think this is going to play into the future of uh, direct to fan and distribution? And uh, do you feel like that's going to bring more people back into BitTorrent, seeing that we're having all these high profile partnerships, uh, whereas perhaps uh, people were starting to lose interest in the in the, in the uh, format altogether or in the platform altogether. Uh, Emily? I think that it's, you know, bringing in partners like Vader and, and Converse and things like that is actually going to appeal to a new section of people. Yeah. Um, I Like, I love BitTorrent and I only use it when I absolutely cannot find a file legally. And that's actually my point is like when yeah. we really need to be making this stuff available. So when I explain it to even interns and kind of younger people or whatever, like they don't, they don't know how to use it. So if yeah. there's a reason for them to use it, like 
you know, and, and Fader does such a great job of, of curating content, that could really be the way. And that technology is just there. And I really applaud BitTorrent for, you know, trying to make some legal steps because they never did anything wrong. They're just the platform. I know that's always kind of the excuse or whatever, <laughs> but it is a really cool way to transfer files, you know? Sure. So if there are really great branding partners helping to bring in, uh, you know, artists that people are into, I, you know, I, I am all for making sense of these technologies and, and BitTorrent has made sense to me for a long time. Um, would you feel comfortable using it for one of your artists, for example, like in the, in the bundles, uh, I know that um, in the bundles, I know that uh, some of the content can be given out for free and then the, uh, the second half of the content uh, it can be gated. So you can gate it for uh, a certain price or for an email address or for whatever you kind of might fancy. Do you, would you feel comfortable using that for one of your artists? Absolutely, because yeah. either we're going to work with BitTorrent or the fans are just going to be on there and you know, we're not engaging with them at all. Exactly. Uh, Seth, yeah, from your perspective, uh, how, how do you feel that that can work? So for me, it feels a bit like we're going back in time. It feels a bit like we're going back, what, eight years to uh, the idea of firewalls and DRM and protecting. And it just feels a bit strange to me. The, I mean, the idea of using BitTorrent, of course, as a distribution network director fan, Obviously, I can see the merits of it and how good that is. The idea of starting to put in paywalls or firewalls or all of those things, firstly, it just seems a bit, I don't know, 2000, the idea you're doing that. Part of the reason why all these services emerged was to stop that happening. But secondly, you're putting it out to a community or an audience who is existing in a hacking uh, file sharing environment in the first place. So the amount of time before somebody just produces something that makes it easily unwrappable, all of yeah. these things, is, I mean, you're in that environment already. So I guess I see it, but I just, yeah, I'm a bit unconvinced. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what they have to do is uh, to try and make the platform more accessible. Like it's, it's what I was, uh, when I was talking to them as well a few months ago, it was, it's a case of it's still very difficult for our mainstream consumer to understand how to download these files you know they have to go and download an application and then they have to find the torrent and they have to download it it's not the most straightforward thing in the world and so i think that they may may have to do a little bit of a better job at uh, making that process more streamlined for a consumer that may may not have used BitTorrent technology before bear in mind people had a problem with, with itunes lps because they were too complicated yeah. and, and that's the thing and that's what's cool about making it legal ultimately if it's in an organized manner you can just say double click this go do something else. When you come back, you know, the file will be there. Yeah. So... Okay. So yeah, no, I mean, I, I look really forward to see what they, what these guys are going to do as well. There's a lot of cool companies that have joined into the scheme, and, and uh, the collective, especially, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by by them being part of the scheme, and I, I want to see what they're gonna what they're gonna be doing with that. And the uh, last story of the day is that we're going to talk about uh, internet radio. So we talked about internet radio already, but there are some more numbers that have come out of a study done by Edison Research uh, that was produ produced in collaboration with uh, Pandora, Spotify, Tune and TuneIn Radio, uh, looking at consumer habits uh, of uh, users uh, on, on streaming services and internet radio in particular. So this was called the Streaming Task Force, which makes it sound very official. Uh, and uh, it surveyed over 3,000 3, online respondents aged uh, 12 plus uh, to ascertain their media usage and habits. So um, we've got a few points here. Uh, First of all, uh, internet radio is now used by the majority of America, online Americans, 53%. Uh, and it's uh, now the third most popular way uh, people discover new music, ahead of Amazon, YouTube, social media, and other sources, which uh, really surprised me. 63% uh, of internet radio listeners own a smartphone. 32% uh, of internet radio listeners indicated that they are listening to a lot more of the medium than they were one year ago, so an increase in adoption, of course, and, and consumption. And 26% of uh, internet radio users uh, told the survey that their in listening is mostly new time so time that was not previously filled with audio of any kind so uh, the last point is really interesting because uh, what i've heard in a few panels in, over the last few weeks i've been to quite a few events uh, as you can tell they're like massive <laughs> <laughs> black sound in my eye but um uh, what i've been hearing is people are always fighting to be the music that is being played instead of something else. So if you're listening to my music as an artist, it means that you're not listening to somebody else's music. And if you're listening to music at all and you weren't listening to music before, then that's really a victory of the music industry as people are, uh, you know, have more access to music and are able to become fans of new bands, while, whereas before maybe that wasn't quite as easy for them to do. So uh, 
it's interesting results, you know, nothing uh, groundbreaking out here, but uh, I was particularly focusing on this uh, new time uh, uh, idea that people that may not listen to audio before are actually engaging in that now. Uh, I don't know, Emily, are, are you excited about that as a manager uh, of artists? Uh, you know, the idea that they may be able to find a new audience and, and in, you know, engage more people into music actively than, than you might have been able to before. Always, absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I said, there's a ton of noise out there, but yeah. I really pride myself on, on working with great artists. That yeah. comes first and foremost. So that's why the art has to come first, and that's what's going to rise above that noise. So yeah. you know, that, that's been something I've really loved about the new music industry over the past decade is people are li listening to more music than ever, and ultimately that's a good thing. Yeah, and Seth, you know, we're always connected in, in the UK, you know, the coverage is getting pretty good, uh, you know, depending on the operator, of course, but the idea that if you have iTunes Radio, for example, on your phone, and, uh, you know, you have nothing else, or you, you're bored of your collection, the idea that you can actually access something instantly without having to think about it, uh, is pretty powerful and, and may actually lead to more people listening to music than they were would have been able to listen to before. Do you buy into that idea and do you feel like uh, because of these services we may see uh, uh, a new wave of people that were into music but weren't actually getting the chance to listen to much music, uh, consume a lot more now? I think if they communicate the proposition correctly, yeah. then yes. Although I have to say that survey reads a bit like a survey commissioned by people who wanted those answers. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's irrelevant of that, I do think if they position it right, so for instance, I have with my uh, Everything Everywhere mobile subscription, yeah. I have unlimited free Deezer premium. Um, unfortunately, I don't use it ever because they didn't communicate it to me very well and I've already got Spotify. But <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of people there that just don't know it. But if you communicated to an audience that hadn't listened to music in quite the way that some of us who feel more passionately do, um, I'm sure if you just explained to them, you've now got whatever music you want, wherever you want, you would definitely break into those new audiences. Yeah. So it's really just about communicating the proposition. Yeah, and that's that's pretty interesting. And, and you can find their research on edisonresearch.com. They got a lovely infographic if you're into your infographics, and you can go and check that out. Uh, and uh, I think uh, at this point we got to the end of the show. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure having you guys on. And uh, uh, Emily, again, it's uh, uh, whitesmithentertainment.com. Is that the right website? Wait, yeah, that works. Perfect. <laughs> uh, and uh, again, do you want to uh, uh, run us through some of your artists just so that people have a, have an idea and go and check them out? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, we manage Brennan Benson of the Rackin' Tours, the Hush Sound, the Autumn Defense, Future Monarchs. We consult on Urge Overkill. Uh, we also manage Olympic gold medalist swimmer Anthony Urban and a slew of incredible comedians. So check out the site. I'm on Twitter, all that. Very accessible. So feel free to reach out anytime. That's awesome. And uh, uh, Seth, uh, for you, it's uh, uh, strangethoughts.com. Uh, uh, what's the website? .co.uk. Uh, strangethoughts.co.uk. That's great. And uh, any particular project that you want to mention that you're working on uh, uh, just to, to close up the show? Well, we're working on a lot of fun projects uh, from space talk about missions it. to mind-controlled <laughs> robots. Uh, nice. but at the moment, I'm interested in to see what we can do with uh, big artist live shows and using technology within those in interesting ways. That's that's really cool, and it was actually what we talked about today in the panel with the uh, the panel with uh, Ian from Soundcake and Dave from SoundCloud, and we're talking exactly about uh, engaging audiences in, in in live in a live environment as well. So really cool stuff. That's great. Well, thanks so much for joining me. It was a pleasure having you on, and thanks so much for listening to Digital Music Trends today. If you enjoy the show, I would love you to pass it on to one more person in your network once you're done listening to it. And you can also email, email your feedback to contact at digitalmusictrends.com or leave a review on iTunes. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great week, and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.